Thank you very much. Veda, um, I'm the last speaker. And so, anyhow, I was asked to um, kind of do a discussion about the reward sessions um, this morning and this afternoon. And uh, they actually, BA gave me a chance, of e uh, opportunity of either giving a talk, um, in which case I, my abstract was overdue, or I could do a discussion, I didn't have to do an abstract, um, and I could present some of my data. So I decided on the latter. Um, hopefully we'll have data, com slides coming up pretty soon, but basically, thank you very much. Um, Basically, I think that there was a, these sessions today on reward were amazing. I mean, this is the best stuff on reward I think I've ever heard. Um, and I think that there's a variety of emerging themes that are coming out from these, um, the work that's being done both in animals and humans. I think we're seeing often heightened striatal sensitivity to rewards. Um, that is not what I would have predicted. I completely agree with Bita about that, that if I, you know, I, if I had a dollar for every hypothesis I had that was wrong, I could retire in fine style. Um, I think that there's also evidence building about unique context sensitivities of reward processing, particularly social context, and, then, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, and I think that there's also some emerging cross-species um, similarities that I think were nicely illustrated by the work of um, um, Susan Anderson and, and others today, really. Um, I would like to say one thing, and this may vote me off the um, adolescent um, island as well, that I have had trouble with this notion of delayed development. I think the delayed development of top-down systems is fine, but when they talk about early maturing um, subcortical systems, I think if you kind of read between the lines today, that that may be a bit of an overstatement, that these subcortical systems are not really mature. I think it might be better to say that they're developmentally evolving and sometimes more reactive or maybe uh, often more reactive or more reactive under some circumstances. But to say that they're mature and responding in a mature type fashion, even at the level, even at the molecular level or at the epigenetic level is probably uh, um, a, a bit optimistic, at least I would argue that. Um, I think that there's a bunch of really cool key emphasis areas that are starting to emerge in the um, adolescent reward um, area. I think this emphasis on individual differences that was um, just talked about several times today is really key because ultimately, as, as in um, Peter talked about in her last talk, the, the really important matter is going to be able to, to, to determine who is going through adolescence is going to be have um, later problems and then how to intervene. So the individual differences is really key. Um, I, I think that we've gotten also a really fabulous sense of the regional specificity of things that alterations are occurring in brain regions, sometimes not the brain regions we would have expected, but hey, that's life. Um, um, and and that, that you'll get very different alterations or, or different timing of alterations in, in other regions. Um, and the changes in network connectivity, I think there was so much to talk about connectivity yesterday, and that was brought up some today, but I think that there's, this is an emerging area of work um, also, I would hope, in the, in the reward area as well. There's this issue of rewards versus aversions, and I don't really have a take-home message for that yet. Um, there's some evidence, Adriana has presented some really nice evidence this morning that adolescents may be more sensitive not only to rewards but also to aversive stimuli. That does not seem to be the general pattern in the animal literature. Um, if you look um, at adolescent typical drug sensitivities, all drugs uh, of abuse have good stuff and they have bad stuff associated with them. Um, and so you can look at lo relatively low doses, they're often the desired effects. At higher doses, you get the aversive effects. And for a variety of do uh, drugs, um, as so, um, as I don't have to explain condition place preference because Susan, Susan already I explained that. Um, but uh, you see that adolescents are more sensitive to the rewarding effects of a variety of different drugs, including nicotine, cocaine, amphetamine, ethanol. On the other hand, 
if rather than looking at condition place preferences, you look at condition place aversions at higher doses or condition taste aversions, what you see is adolescents are less sensitive than adults to the aversive effects of these same drugs, higher doses of these same drugs, and other drugs as well. Um, the cannabinoids, such as THC, um, is also, they're also less sensitive to the aversive effects as, that as well. So it seems to be the shift in sensitivity to appetitive and aversive effects, at least with respect to drugs. Um, in terms of condition taste aversion, um, it's a very similar uh, phenomena. Basically, you give the animals a, a novel taste that they like, you inject them with a drug such as alcohol, after, and immediately thereafter, and then later on you ask them how they feel about the taste. If they found that alcohol injection aversive, they will avoid the taste, show a taste aversion. You can see across, this is the control solution here. Across the three doses, all three doses that were tested initially, um, adults showed an aversion um, uh, across these doses of alcohol. Adolescents did not. Adolescents required a whole higher dose range to show a condition taste aversion. So that's an example of those kind of data. It's not only just drugs, though. It may con continue um, extend to other stimuli as well. If you look at taste uh, reactivity testing, you can do this in rats. You can do it in monkeys. You can do it in neonatal uh, humans as well. You put tastes into their mouths and you ask them how, how they felt about those tastes. For positive tastes at an intermediate dose, adolescents are more sensitive than adults. For negative tastes, um, adults show greater aversive responding to the taste than do adolescents. Social context is really important. Um, and we, we heard elegantly about that um, in, this, in the, t the two talks about um, social, social reward um, this morning. Um, there's evidence that social context in our animal models um, decreases the aversiveness of stimuli. Um, if you look at condition taste aversion, um, and this is an effect that's only seen in males, and you look at now um, the higher doses of alcohol that would normally induce a condition taste aversion in, an in a male adolescence, it does not do so um, in what, if they're tested in a social context. So being tested in a social context is protecting the animals from even more adolescents, even more from these aversive effects. On the other hand, and this is work not done in my lab, but um, Theo's lab, that if you give a sub-threshold dose of nicotine or a sub-threshold uh, exposure to a social stimulus, you do the pair of those two together, you get um, a condition place preference to nicotine only in the presence of the social stimulus. So he says, for instance, a synergistic interaction between nicotine and social rewards in adolescent rats. So the social stimulus may also increase the appetitive properties while it's reducing the aversive properties. Um, in our social drinking um, paradigm, this is very similar to what Jason's um, work was talking about this morning. What we do is we ask, uh, we allow animals to interact socially at day 28. And a week later, we allow them to drink in a social context. What we find is, is the magnitude of social behavior uh, at day 28 predicts, predicts the amount of ethanol drinking in a social context a week later. Um, and we see this um, both in terms of correlations and if we do um, uh, a median split and look at low uh, social activity and high social activity, the animals that are so, more socially active drink more in a social context. This is specific to social drinking. You don't see, when the, see this when the animals are tested alone. And also we see differences in CFOS and uh, immunoreactivity. Um, the social brain of uh, subcortically, um, we are seeing um, changes, um, increases in the presence of a social stimulus in um, amygdala and extended amygdala areas that in adolescents that we are not seeing in adults. There's also, um, I think, uh, by, as exemplified by the last two talks, um, the two talks this afternoon, there's um, a continuing interest in dopamine changes in adolescence because, after all, most of the brain regions that are undergoing tremendous change during adolescence do receive dopaminergic input. Um, and um, there's a lot of differences in um, what you're seeing in the dopamine system is very me measure and very regional specific, and these, the talks we just had really gave elegant examples of that. Uh, one of the really tricks in the dopamine system is this very compensatory system, right? Um, you can deplete 95% of dopamine before you get symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So when you start decreasing one thing in the dopamine system, it tends to want to 
overcompensate by increasing, at least in the adult, uh, and the, the compensations may be different um, developmentally, so we have to keep those in mind. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that, that uh, dopamine may not, even within the same brain region, may be activated differently by multiple aspects of reward um, seeking. And for an example of that, some of our data with uh, Donna, um, Danita Robinson, where we were looking at dopamine transients or um, dopamine voltometry, which is an electrophysiological way to really look at really dopamine release, effects of dopamine release electrophysiologically. And what you see in response to novel stimuli, uh, odor, tone, or white noise in the setting is actually that adults are showing a greater uh, dopamine transient response in the nucleus accumbens core than are due at adolescence. On the other hand, if you give, if present the animals with a cue and give them a food reward, they don't have to do anything. It's just the cue is presented and then the food reward after a number of trials. What you see is that the adults don't really respond that much to the reward, whereas the adolescents keep responding with the dopamine transient response to the reward, whereas in response to the cue, the response is very similar in adolescents and adults. So depending on what you're looking at, you can see um, hypo, hyper, or no differences in reactivity and dopamine transient response within the nucleus accumbens, depending on what aspect of reward you're looking at. Novel, novel stimuli, of course, is highly re reinforcing for adolescents. Okay, final note on puberty. Um, and this is what really may vote, vote me off the island. Um, what is sort of generally thought is, is that there's this kind of general developmental pace. And that at some point in time, that, that drives pubertal timing. And then you get these puberty-dependent brain and behavioral changes. And this general de developmental pace also influences pubertal independent brain and behavioral changes, um, and that both are going on. So the strategy has often been to look for things that are correlated with pubertal timing um, and, and relate that um, to um, and, and conclude that that's a pubertally hormonally based um, phenomenon. Another possibility, though, is, is that general developmental place not only affects pubertal timing, but it also presumably um, this general developmental pace affects pubertally independent brain and behavioral changes as well. So that going on during this time of puberty, there may be changes that just happen to be going on synonymously at that time that may be driven by the same sort of general um, developmental pace that are not necessarily purely related. At least we worry, I've been worried about that a little bit. Uh, the other thing that's been shown in animal studies fairly recently by Cheryl Sisk is this exciting phenomenon, which is, is that we used to think that the brain was sexual differentiated, occurred prenatally, and that that was pretty much it. Prenatally in the early postnatal period is when the rises and early rises in sex hormones induce sexual differentiation of the brain. And then when the hormones ro rose and you got these brain regions activated. Um, at least with regard to sexual behavior. Well, show, Sisk has shown that no, there's a second period of sexual differentiation of the brain during adolescence where these sexual rises in sexual hormones are actually changing um, certain sexually dimorphic brain regions to re and are strongly related to sexually, sex typical reproductive behaviors. So, the, so this, is, this is called a second organizational uh, effect of these hormones. So rises in pubertal hormones might not only affect things that are going on at the time, but they could have lasting organizational effects to affect long, um, behavior long term. So how do you distinguish between that? Um, well, you heard about um, strategies, and the real exciting strategies are being used in comp complicated strategies during the last couple of days, trying to just look at that in um, humans. In rats, we have an advantage that you can't do in humans. We can go in and gonadectomize animals. Um, so we can take out their gonads preputerally and see what ha um, impact that has on their later behavior, arguing if they needed the gonads during pubertal during the pubertal period for these changes, then taking away pupillary gonadectomizing the animals would take away that. Uh, it's been it was sort of a depressing story. Um, in females, um, we see no alterations in ethanol intake. There are typically sex differences in ethanol intake. Adolescents in our animal models drink more alcohol than do adults. 
Um, if we go to adectomized females, there's no change in that story. There's also no effect in females of gonadectomy on responsiveness to alcohol. A variety, we look at a lot of different responses to alcohol. Um, alcohol due to social stimulation, so, uh, social suppression, higher doses, blah, blah, blah. Um, activity, novelty seeking, no changes in that. There's a slight alterations in the microstructure of social behavior, but I wouldn't write home about that. In males, um, we do see that in males that prepubertal gonadectomy uh, induces a female type ethanol intake pattern. So it seems that you need testosterone to have a male type um, ethanol intake pattern. And that would be really exciting, except for the fact that we don't think it's an organizational effect or, or pubertal specific in that if you take the gonads that out um, of males in adulthood, you also make um, them drink like females and that testosterone replacement at any point in time restores male typical um, intake patterns. So we think it's just what's called an activational effect of the hormones on later behavior. And again, in the males, no effect in responsiveness to ethanol, novelty seeking activity or slight alterations of microstructure along with some slight alterations in microstructure of social behavior. So we've been looking for a really long time because we expected to see dramatic effects of gonadectomies prepubertally in, in rats because we thought that hormones would play an even greater role in rats than in humans where there's so much else going on. And we've been kind of disappointed. If you look at the gonadal hormone dependent and independent effects on developmental changes in dopamine, um, you kind of see a similar story. Some effects and, and other times not. This is data from um, Susan Anderson's lab from a while back where she was looking at developmental declines in striatum of D1 and D2 receptors in control and in gonadectomized animals, what you can see is no effect of um, prepubertal gonadectomy on the developmental, normal developmental decline in D1 and D2 receptors. And this other study that was done by Noel et al., um, they were looking, oops, I gave the punch wrong anyway. They were looking at age differences in dopamine release from substantial Niagara. And again, there's a developmental decrease in this between with adolescents having much greater release than adults. If you go in and prepubertally gonadectomize these animals, look at them in adulthood, what you see is the gonadectomized animals or sort of approaching what you see in, um, in adolescent animals. So it appears that there was some role, but not, uh, not entirely, uh, complete role of gonadal hormones on this um, developmental decline. So that's what I told, what I talked about. Um, I think this is a fantastic session. I'd like to thank the speakers, and I especially like to thank Bia and all the other organizers of the Flux. This is a remarkable meeting, thanks.